Today's guest is Jim Gilmore, an assistant professor of innovation and design within the Weatherhead School of Management at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland. Right, Jim, in Cleveland? Yes, in Cleveland. Yeah. It's, a mouth, it's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> Jim, Jim is also co-author of The Experience Economy, Competing for Customer Time, Attention, and Money, highly relevant to our audience. Uh, this book you know, spawned worldwide interest in experience design, customer experience management, and experiential marketing. His ideas have been featured in numerous articles on business strategy and innovation for such publications as HBR, Harvard Business Review, The Wall Street Journal, and Investors Business Daily, among others. A few publications people have heard of. Jim, welcome to Unobstructed. Well, thank you very much for having me. So let's let's talk about you know the, your your background first before we get into the experience economy because it's just such a fascinating topic that dovetails with the live event space. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I after six years with Procter and Gamble, I went into consulting, sort of a jun probably the most junior person this logistics firm had hired, and so it's a, a long way from that. We're here with experiences, and and here's just a quick story of how we we got there. I got involved with process innovation. I, I was never good with small motor skills and, and being, you know, making physical things. But the idea of, of being innovative about how work is done was the first time from a from a vocation standpoint, I became intellectually interested in, in the work. And I was with uh, Computer Sciences Corporation, the folks that invented re-engineering or business process re-engineering. Mm -hmm. And before the IT departments, uh, you know, sort of bastardized it into downsizing. Uh, <laughs> I did a couple of projects in that space. Uh, the index group invented this. And I became a chief with well, why redesign a process. And after doing a large project for Whirlpool and Kellogg's, both of which with extensive customer interviewing, basically was using the phrase, everybody wants something different. That was my sort of phrase. Then I came across this term mass customization and then came across a book by that title by Joe Pine, now my co-author and business partner, and read the book, wrote him a letter, and we we hit it off, right? And so the notion, the, the, and I wrote him because he had this one model about having stable process design capable of dynamic output. So we started our own firm, and then Joe for years, not only does advocate customizing goods, but also was an advocate of customizing services. And he once got a question in an executive ed session, well, Joe, you want us to, custom? Joe would say, if you customize a good, you automatically turn that good into a service. Think Dell computer before they lost their way. They're a computer making service. They never made a computer and placed it in the inventory. They only made computers in response to actual demand. So we got this question, well, what happens if we customize a service? What do we automatically turn a service into? And he just viscerally just said, well, you turn it into an experience. Mm. I'll never forget, he called me that night. I said, Jim, guess what I said? Like, and then, and then it just, and then at some point, one of us said, you make a good delivery service, but you stage an experience. And that stage where it was like, that resonated with my process work I was doing because it provided a different lens, a different model for thinking how work is done. And I really became a student of theater, frankly, from an academic standpoint, my bookshelf on theater from, from visioning to set design to, to costuming to directing, it's just extensive. And just the idea of, of a model, not a metaphor, a model for how to look at how work is performed. And so, and early on, the thought came, I remember going to Nike town in the early 80s, the very first one, when I was still with Procter & Gamble, because I was fascinated. Okay, they, were, they, were telling, they were telling retailers, we're not going to compete with you. We're, this is going to be a marketing mechanism. You'll sell more shoes because people are coming to this place. And there was a rope line outside. I fully expected to pay when I got in, no admission fee. So that anecdote came to mind when we said this you know, experience economy, right? And the, the notion that I know a lot of your clients in the arts and sporting events, that's the long established traditional venue. But the idea of more and more businesses need to layer on top of their goods and services, experiences, right? Time spent in certain places and events, not just the physical goods you manufacture, not just the activities you perform as a service, but the notion of the, the commercialization of experiences beyond sports and, and entertainment, uh, you know, that, that we got to work on that. And then we wrote a Harvard Business Review. We've actually first wrote in the Wall Street Journal, How to Profit from Experience. And then the Harvard Business Review, Welcome to Experience Economy. And then it just like, it just resonated. I mean, it just, it just, I cannot tell you how it just, boom. Because I think we, we write about what people were doing, but we gave language 
to what so many enterprises were doing, but didn't have a way of, they were sort of viewing it as a subset of services as opposed to something distinctive in kind. And I think that's why the book resonated throughout the world, frankly, like I think 19 languages now, it's crazy. Wow. And that, yeah. and that was what year? That was 1999? Uh, 97, 97 was the Wall Street Journal, 98, Harvard Business Review, then 99, the, the book. And, and uh, you know, Harvard just December of 2019 decided to reissue it in hardcover, which is a rare thing. And we wrote a new preface. Of course, they released it in December of 2019. Nice timing. <laughs> <laughs> Who would know that the experience economy would collapse a few months later? Well, or did it? I mean, that's the interesting thing. When you look at kind of the, the new kinds of experiences that have exploded during during the pandemic, True. I think I think the question becomes, you know, like what 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 have we just have we broadened our definition of what an experience is? And I think it's interesting to hear you talk about that economy evolution from commodities to goods to services to experiences and you use the word stage the experience. Well, you know, this the word stage obviously I think came from you know the live events industry. It's like I, that's that 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 was the beacon, I think, in in kind of saying how do other industries create an experience? I think what's fascinating though, and I'm curious to get your take is that for live events, it used to just be what was on stage. That was the experience. But literally, I think we've learned, literally, right. literally we've right. learned though since 1999, you published that book and, and most recently that what's on stage, what's on the field is almost becoming less relevant. It's the broader experience you're having at the venue before the event, after the event, the lead up to the event, who you're able to talk to, what plat social media platforms you're interacting with, what your seat's like, is it comfortable? You think about the movie experience now, it's people go to the movies or go to the show, you know, they almost don't care what's playing. You know, it's, it's about the broader experience. And I, I, I guess my question to you is, is, you know, obviously with HBR kind of deciding to, to republish it, congrats on that, by the way, 20 yeah, years you. later, it's just as relevant. Were you ahead of your time in 1999 or uh, were you, were you well, right on we, the mark? We, we, we gave a term to what was starting to happen. Yeah. Um, you know, Alvin Toffler hinted at this at Future Perfect. And we, we did our best, our very best to, to cite in the book some of those early sources. But we were the first to really talk about experience as an economic offering of charging explicitly for the experience. And at the time we wrote the book, we were hard pressed for examples, right? So, I mean, some of the, we obviously we had Disney, you know, theme parks and so forth, but like, you know, some early versions of this at malls that fault. I mean, people think we want to turn everything into Planet Hollywood. Like, no, we're being, we were desperate. Now I cannot even keep up. Yeah. Right? The, the invention of new experiences, by the way, not just entertainment experiences. Chapter two of the book talks about four different types of experiential value that together make for an engaging experience. There's entertainment value, educational value, escapist value, right? Aesthetic ha hangout value. And more and more of the experiences are more, more active participation, right? The invention of tough mutter, right? Mm -hmm. uh, immersive theater. You don't just watch the show. You're in the show. I think of, you know, sleep no more, you know, kind of thing in, in New York that sort of got all that publicity. Um, all, you know, Zorbing is invented. Uh, uh, chess boxing, where you do three minutes of chess and then two minutes of boxing. I mean, this, you know, this is an explosion of new experiences, and it's because that's what people most value. And all of life is an experience, but our main point is more and more of that is being commercialized, attaching a fee to it. And we think it's a necessity because it takes less and less people to extract commodities uh, because of the forces of automation and productivity. In the United States, only 3% of the population less works in agriculture, less than 10% in manufacturing. It was in the 1950s when in the US, and I think Canada soon to follow, people mainly was, was services. And now services are being automated. Mm -hmm. right? it's, either, it's either uh self-service, uh poor service or no service, right? And and now experiences are the differentiator. So, you know, it's it's Starbucks providing a place to spend time drinking your coffee. It's parents paying for the birthday party that they used to host themselves, but now they pay another a laser tag center or a you know pottery studio. So more and more of life is being is being uh, not just in existing industries layering on experiences, but also new to the world experiences, escape rooms, 
<laughs> right? In fact, there's so much more competition for traditional uh, uh, live event organizations. In fact, it, okay, escape room, saw it happening, did one with my family. Learned a lot about family dynamics, by the way, in doing that. <laughs> <laughs> my wife and son sort of backed off, and you know, as, as my as my daughter and I sort of were the aggressive ones. But then when I saw rage rooms, you pay to smash stuff, and then salt rooms, which is like massage room without a masseuse, and then and then I thought room the room is the smallest unit of experience, so we don't need an elaborate production. Although there's there's news there too. There's Cirque du Soleil, right? All the different productions. But the fact that it's not difficult to enter, to, it's hard to invent a new good. Like what's the, like, what's the best we've had in the last 10 years? Like the Segway, you know, that was going to revolutionize transportation or the Swiffer mop. Yeah. Really hard to invent a new category. Good. In some ways, hard to invent a new service, but, you know, coming up with new ways for people to spend time, that's, that's like almost limitless possible. I, latest one I heard was like plogging in Europe. It's a mashup of jogging and collecting, uh, picking up trash. There's like 10K plogging events, right? There's, there's, just, like, there's, there's so many, time is the currency of experiences. Mm. And there's more and more competition for people's time. And for, for traditional venues, that just raises the bar in terms of, like you said, it's not just the, the main event but it's all the other things that extend that out pre entering post and, and even augmenting um, experiences as well. Yeah. And you, and you raised a few examples. I think at times in the live event space, you know, we, 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 we haven't really, you know, looked at these experience economy to say, well, how can, how can we continue to, to monetize it and, and profit from it? Right. Uh, so I, I always, I, I try to help, you know, by, by looking outside, and you you raised a few examples. You talked about the birthday party and 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 a few others. I think the the one that that I think is it, people have resonated the most when I've when I've raised it is is the taxi experience versus the Uber experience. Absolutely, and it's mass the, customized they, taxi cab. They both provide the same you know the same service, but the experience is hands down night and day. When you think about with Uber, the fact that you have GPS and you know when your ride's going to arrive or you can choose where you want to be picked up, you know, how, how frictionless payment is. And, you know, the fact that you can choose music now or tell your Uber driver whether you want to talk or don't want to talk or uh, they give you water and, and all this kind of stuff. I mean, I think that that to me is a great uh, example of, of how the experience economy can really disrupt market share. Even more precisely, Mike, you're right. It, it's like now my go-to example of what I would consider the most powerful but neglected concept in the experience economy, which relates to customization, right? You customize a service, you automatically have an experience. And why do you customize? Like Stan Davis, who coined the term mass customization, had this brilliant piece of business wisdom. He, he's, he's, he asked and answered his own question, what and where should you customize? His answer was you should customize as much as necessary and as little as possible. Mm. that's like brilliant and yeah. where you customize how do you determine that where is that much as necessary as possible well we have this idea of customer sacrifice not satisfaction which is about meeting expectations the gap between what you expect and what you perceive you get but this idea of customer sacrifice which we define as the gap between what people settle for and what they want exactly traditional taxi cab i gotta hail one down in new york and i'm not a new yorker i'm not good at that or walk seven blocks to the hotel where I know they're lined up. But now, right, it's, it's, it's mass customized cab service and it automatically is a better experience. Even before you talk about layering on the music or you like a bottle of water. And by the way, in the live event space, it's not, it's not just going to the rock concert anymore. It's hiring the limo service to take you there. It's the after party afterwards. And consumers will invent the stuff themselves. Mm -hmm. My most recent book is on observational skills, especially when people come back to live events as it comes back. You've got to be watchful for the behaviors. That'll tell you much of what they'll start doing what they want. Right? And this is where Las Vegas is really. Las Vegas scours the world looking for new uh, experiential behaviors that they can commercialize. A, a, an ice, uh, you know, an ice hotel opens up in Scandinavia. Next thing you know, we have an ice bar in Las Vegas, right? I mean, uh, people start having their own man caves. All of a sudden, 
of McFadden's inside of Rio opens up a man cave where you can, for 500 bucks, you get a keg of beer and a hundred wings and watch a sporting event. Oh, who, who, who buys that room at three in the morning? Uh, European soccer fans, <laughs> right? It, we're in a global world. There's sporting events live around the world. Here's a place. The other thing Las Vegas does is they, you know, they refresh. It's open for five years. Now it's closed. They pop up a, a new thing. So again, it's global. And what we learned through the, 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 the Zoom world we're all in now, you're competing with experiences globally now as, as well, not just in your town. So what's your advice to, you know, these live event organizations who might be intimidated by this? Why should they be actually optimistic and excited oh. about getting into this game? Right. Well, here's the reason for optimism. Um, in the new preface for the re-release book, we talk about time as a currency of experiences. And we categorize that in two categories. There's time well saved and there's time well spent. And a lot of people use the word experience, especially if you hear like uh, user experience, customer experience, they really mean better service. Mm -hmm. They really think making things easy, convenient, which ultimately save people time. We talk about time well spent, terms, that's what you can charge for. Like, but, so here's the optimism. There is a set of behaviors that emerged because of COVID. My wife orders groceries and picks them up, right? We got curbside pickup of, of food. My wife and I are like, you know, why are we, our house is better than some restaurants. Let's just get their food and bring it home. Some of those behaviors are going to continue. Mm -hmm. The CEO of Walmart is going to say, he thinks most of it is going to continue in his industry. But most of those act, new behaviors are time saving. You don't have to drive into the, the to the uh, ortho, orthodontist to get your fitting for the, he mails you the mold and you put it in. You don't have to wait 45 minutes in the waiting room. By the way, what a dumb idea, waiting rooms. <laughs> you know, and then all, so all that time savings, when we get whatever going to emerge in post-COVID post crisis, people are going to have more time on their hands. They're going to be looking for ways. That they're going to stop doing certain other things because they're saving time and they are going to spend it. So I think the, the optimism, there's an opportunity for innovation here. Peter Drucker, um, in his book, Innovation and Entrepreneurship, says that all innovation is a function of recognizing, observing discontinuities. And I don't think we have discontinuities yet. I think we have a, we've had a giant disruption from which multiple discontinuities will emerge. We, mm -hmm. He talks about changes in technology and process and demographics in behavior. So I think now is a great opportunity to innovate. And I would suggest you need to build out a portfolio of options. And I've got a, a framework that might be worth exploring here that I can verbally describe versus, you know, booting up the share screen PowerPoint, uh, which is awful. Um, you know, I'll try to uh, explain. I, I think that's, now's the time to build out your portfolio, envision many options and then try a couple. Because mm -hmm. I think we've been leaving, live events have been leaving money on the table by not thinking richly enough. Again, I mentioned waiting rooms. Did it really take the Corona crisis for hospitals to realize that having sick people gather in a room together is a dumb idea? Did it really take this for hotels to realize they really have double their room occupancy, not just overnight, but over day, which has emerged, right? I mean, I mean, there, there have been opportunities, like now they'll call them uh, uh, overdue experiences mm. that have now come to the fore. Now's a great opportunity to add to one's portfolio. You got the sporting event. Okay, what's your pre and post show? Basic. You know, what's your, uh, not just the, what's, what's your smaller subset? Sporting events. I thought for over 10 years, when are we going to build away game facilities? You make the playoffs and then all of a sudden we have people come into a venue designed for home games to watch on a TV and away game. No, we can design a facility specifically for away games. Mm -hmm. Right? I can point to the designers who I know could, could build it. <laughs> you know, so I think there's huge opportunities for those. And by the way, it's going to be the leading adapters who do it first. And then people will see what they're doing. The best practices will emerge and everybody will follow. But I'm very optimistic about the opportunities in this space, frankly. Yeah, no, I, I, I think so, too. And I think not being afraid to fail is, is, is right. really important. Right. I think too, but that fail small, fail small. Yeah, <laughs> but, but I think by by creating experiments that are small enough that that target a specific group of your of your audience, I think that's right. that that's the the reality. I think the only sometimes the only commonality we we 
the only thing we have in common is what's on stage or what's on the field. Right. My mindset going to a game or to a, a concert versus yours might be fundamentally different. I got to get back for the babysitter and I got to do this That's and right. I got to do that. You are thinking about where you're going to have a nightcap. That's because what, no, no two people can have the same experience, period. Commodities, goods, and services exist outside of people. Experiences is, exist inside of us. Even when we go to the same theme park, or we go to the same sporting event. Did you see that? No, I missed it. But we all navigate the space uh, uh, differently. Now, some are more shared, the stage, the traditional stage yeah. uh, production. But this is why this room idea, start with a single room. Take a room. What could you do in that room that's a pre or post show? What uh, I did some work with the San Diego Padres uh, uh, 2019. Where's your fantasy sport? Where's your rotisserie league room for everybody? Yeah. Or your section of the stadium where all the people get together because they have that common... I mean, we're, we're, we're seating people randomly as opposed to the, I can even see like, let, for me, let's put all the Yankees fans in a separate section. Right. And like put like chicken wire around it so we can throw things at them and without, without harm, you know, you know again, I, I could go on and on. Well, it's, it, it, it's true though. I mean, I think that you, you look at, 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 you know, performing arts or you think about that traditional theater experience, which is like phones on silent, like, you know, stay dark, like, you know, don't, don't make noise. And I think that, that, you know, you have to wonder whether there's a section of the audience that just won't come until that's possible. So do you put them behind in that room where they can, we think any uh, sector that you work with, but theater, I mean, again, I'm just ideating top of mind. Where's the behind smoke glass side thing that they can comment on the comment on the acting as they go. Yeah. Where's the live class that's taking place, right? Where you only look, you know, act one, scene, scene one, or scene two, and you you. Where's the group that stays afterwards and talks with the director? Or again, we could go birthday parties. By the way, wonderful thing about the birthday business. Every day somebody has one. <laughs> right. So all these venues. What at a starting point? What's your birthday offering? Theater. You take a little improv class for the kids and the, and the thing. And oh, by the way, you're more likely to have them come to your actual performances if you do the connective tissue between improv, which you often learn first and become an actor. And again, there's there's some natural augmenting experiences to to take into consideration as well. Before you mentioned, you know, again, fail small, which I think is a I, I think was is wise advice. I'm curious. You know whether you've seen you've seen examples of of people either taking this too far uh, or trying to do too much in the experience economy, like where it just falls flat. Any any examples, I guess that, that you well, could. This, this is true overall. We do have a there is the sort of the mindset of like uh, you know place big bets, you know, uh, occasionally versus you know lots of bets, small bets often fail fail small fail often, right? So prototyping. But the nice thing about about uh, experimenting with experiences, it's not like you have to build out an actual prototype that's physical. Mm -hmm. right? It's more difficult to prototype, but you, you can try experiences. If they work, keep doing them. If they don't, stop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's, it, you, there's, there's a lot more room for experimentation than people realize. Now, where does it fail? Well, the failures that I see where people confuse our three chapters on work as theater as being theatrical or drama, you know, strategy is drama being dramatic. You know, if you do both in performing arts, no, if you if you act well, no one knows you're acting, right? So the failures are people who mis, sort of misconceive the messaging. Again, I've already referenced chapter two, four realms of experience to think we're just talking about entertainment. No, you got to think about different types of experiential uh, value. There have been some, some big plays you know, building you know, anything that's huge venue inherently runs risk. You'll know, see guy in Japan's this giant $2 billion development effort. You know, somebody bought it for like 10 cents on the, for 10 cents on the yen, I guess I should say, or whatever the sub point of the yen is. But then you got like Islands of Adventure, $2 billion effort that did well. So, you know, big or small, they're small that, that fill you. You always have to do this well. By, by the way, you, shifting to experiences doesn't automatically make you success. It's just like any aspect of business. You have to do it well. And we work real hard in our book and our work subsequent to, to you know, how, how do you, it starts with, by the way, it starts with mindset. 
before we get into conceptual models and, and concepting, you have to recognize that experiences are a distinct form of economic output, that you, you can charge for time, that that's what people most value. And to don't just conceptualize new widgets and new services, but conceptualize new ways to spend time. Uh, th that's the opportunity for, for revenue. You know, I had a session with a early on experience. I remember doing a session for, I mean, I've done probably 10 downtown councils and I know I've done, you know, 15 state tourism and I, from Owen, I'll do connect candle for you, from Owen Sound, Ontario to the province of Alberta, since you're a Canadian company. And I remember meeting with a art museum once who talked about their difficulties with, with finances. Hmm. And I'm like, time share the art. They're like, what? I'm like, well, you don't pay these people, so they're not all on display. You can maintain 51% ownership, but take a Picasso and like sell fractional ownership and you can have it in your house for a week, right? Just when you're entertaining. I mean, they're like, oh, that's against our charter. I'm like, well, I mean, now you have these, these, these NF, these, you know, uh, non-fungible tokens, Token. right? Yeah. That could have been anticipated. I had the idea of like, once you had digitized music, I thought, well, just sell one copy, eBay it. Maybe Pepsi buys the new track of the Rolling Stones for, I mean, th this is Wu, Wu, Wu Tang Clan. Wu Tang did that, Wu Tang. Wu -Tang. Wu -Tang. Yeah, they printed, they printed one vinyl album and toured with them. And then yeah. they sold it afterwards. This shows you the possibilities of what can be, what can be done today. We're gonna to perform this once, or certainly the, are we charging for dress rehearsal at a theater? Right, we charge for spring training and sports. I mean, seriously? I paid my fair share dollars for I mean just to be out in the sun because like the game is meaningless. Yeah. The play the star players only play for two innings, and yet people pay. Because there's all kinds of opportunities. So what you know, as we as we uh went through this crazy year that that locked down essentially locked down completely the live events industry. Yeah. You know, I, I'm I'm curious if you see. And again, that you don't you don't you don't live with live events. You live with experiences. But I'm curious if you like the live events is a big a big chunk of what I've done. Yeah, it is. Particularly with meetings and conferences and that that whole trade show space. I mean, it's a different kind, but there's a lot of similarities. Yeah. And I'm I'm what 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 I'm curious about is your take on consumer reaction as things start to reopen. Are you you know everyone's had now a year to kind of you know experience different things and in different ways and create new behaviors and exercise different muscles and I'm, I'm you know I think there's a um a question as to who's going to come back to those traditional experiences exactly. and, no doubt and, and th there's no silver bullet one has to observe it's going to happen differently with different genres of live experience there's no there's no going to be no uniform behavior everybody is unique we have to be watchful for it there are certain categories as I as I I, as I feel the question, of what's going to happen? Like you're asking, mm -hmm. I thought about different categories. There's going to be neglected experiences I've referred to before that we should have been doing all along. I think we're going to see more outdoor, even when it's not just for for safety purposes. I think there's going to be more miniaturized. Here, here's where the escape rooms have escape rooms stop. Who wants to be in a small room with a bunch of people? So they've gone to more mail, more more episodic. Mail a kit, come to the virtual thing. Mail, we'll see more integrated virtual physical uh, mm -hmm. interplay. So I think miniaturized, I think mashups. Is, and they're, the one big category that I see is made for video streaming experiences. The, the one thing that popped in my head as I watch all this is I lived in California early in my Procter Gamble career when in 1984, the Summer Olympics went to LA. And I thought, I'm going to take all my two weeks vacation. And I'm going to LA. I'm going to the Summer Olympics. I was a cross country and track guy. And then I saw a Peter Uberoff interview. If you call 80, some people maybe listen are not old enough to recall, but 72, 76, and 80 Olympics were disasters mm -hmm. from the hostage crisis in Munich to like the boycotts. And they were on their financial last legs. And Uberoff came in, saved the day, time, man of the year kind of thing. And I remember an interview where he said the only reason to have an audience so that it looks good on television and he hired john jerdy or probably our favorite architect who you know la was like this dispersed venues all over the place but with with skinning of all the facilities made it, on tv made them look like they were much more concentrated on it and uh so i researched this a little bit i found a quote in the design magazine that talked about the the footage is the scene is the site 
Hmm. Right? So I can imagine a much more curated audience, maybe in a smaller audience. Who do you want to, who do you want the audience to be? And then who watches it afterwards or who went and then watches the video version? So I think this this you you have the live event in order for it to be recorded. I'll, I'll do a trade show analogy. because uh, I did a lot of space in trade shows. Um, there's been videos and trade shows for like decades, almost a hundred percent recorded video. Mm -hmm. Why aren't we streaming people in live, like the five plant managers for the company are being here? It's like the ESPN show where they have the four sports writers, they eliminate one each go. There's all kinds of design. And then if you record all that, it becomes a show separately. This is no different than that all the, the you know, whether it's, uh, you know, Rush Limbaugh, Howard Stern, Don Imus, radio show, and then TV of the radio show, right? Dual purposing of these uh, events. So I think there's going to be a lot more curated. Who do you want in the audience? You know, who do you want to go talk to the movie about? Who do you want, you know, uh, and, and, and events inside of events? Mm -hmm. This is the model I, re I referred to early. A lot of this thinking of one way is, is economy of scale thinking as opposed to the economy of scope. So here's my simple model on that, which is let's start. You can cut the data by, by either people, a number of people, frequency, or price point. So if you normally have, let's start with people. If you normally have a thousand people come to your event, mm -hmm. think order of, I call it order of magnitude thinking, that your main event's a thousand person theater. Well, what event do you have for a hundred? What event do you just have for 10? What event do you have just for one? Mm -hmm. In the other direction, what do you have for 10,000 and 100,000? A million people. Some of those are going to be the streamed events. Right? Then you say, well, what's the frequency of it? Just because I have, I might be every day I'm a thousand, but once a week I do a hundred, once a month I do just 10, once a year I do the, 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 the member, the patron of the year experience or whatever, I could eBay it, I could, you know, auction it. Um, and then what's the price point, including free, right? So that, that's first cut based on order of magnitude based on audience size. Then you can do order of magnitude based on frequency. If you normally meet weekly, okay, what do you do daily? What do you do hourly? Otherwise, what do you do monthly? What do you do quarterly? What do you do annually? What do you do once in a lifetime? And then Joe, my co-author, came up with thrice in a lifetime. Like, Joe, what are you talking about? Like, well, that's like Disney. You go as a kid, you go as a parent, you go as a grandparent. Oh, interesting. Good. Um, American Girl Place might be tapping into that. So that's the cut based on frequency. Same thing. What's, what's the number of people? What's mm -hmm. the price point? Then you can do based on price point. If your normal ticket price is 50 bucks, what's your $5 version? What's your 500? What's your 5,000? What's your 50,000? What's your five? Order night. This is like Hamilton, right? Yep. Which has another concept we have in the preface is based on the money value of time, no, the, 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 the time value of money, financial term, a dollar today is worth more than a dollar. We came up with a new metric, which is the, the um, uh, money value of time. You can calculate what revenue you're getting on a per minute basis. So movie cinema, two hour movie, 120 minutes, pay 12 bucks, you know, US 12 bucks, 10, 10 cents a minute. That's about what Starbucks is for a cup of coffee. You know, uh, Hamilton, $5 a minute. Yeah. Right. Unless you win the lottery, in which case is like one of the best buys you can get six cents a minute. Right. So, so you, you, you play out this portfolio of options. So you have three matrices. Each portal in, number of people, frequency, price point will help you ideate. You'll come up with different things depending on what, what lens you come in. You know, three windows to the same room, right? Come ideate possibilities. You don't have to do them all, but it gives you a bunch of options on which ones you want to add to your, your portfolio. You might just have the annual contest for, for, for big, but you might have the, a new digital experience. You, but I, I, I've done the model with a couple of clients and you will come. It was it was born by the way with Whirlpool, longstanding client. I was with the KitchenAid division. They said they were one billion dollars in sales at the time. Had a meeting with them. They said we want to double our revenue in five years. I go okay. This is how this model was born. Okay, I go. What's your average price point? They go about thousand dollars for refrigerator for washer dryer. Go, okay, so you basically have to sell a million. So basically, you want to double your business five years. You got to find a million more people per year to make a purchase. Well, you've got GE and everybody else competing against you. We did the price thing. Thousand dollars. Well, can you sell for ten, order of magnitude tens of thousand dollars? A uh, kitchen remodel. Why are you not in that business? Why are you selling appliances to kitchen remodelers, 
highly fragmented business, why don't you, what do you people buy for $100,000? Homes, a million dollar, why don't you sell a thousand million dollar KitchenAid designer homes? Get you to a billion dollars, right? So it's, that's how this model was born is, is, is there is more revenue to be gathered by changing out the by changing out the mix, I love that. I, I think it's a neat exercise. I can definitely figure out how how to apply it to live events. I think I think when you're looking to, you know, uh, increase your representation and the types of people you're you're trying Absolutely. to attract, and and you look at the different mediums that people are used to now, where it's like, do we do live events? Do we do streaming? Well, the answer is probably both. I mean, you're creating price points. Um, sporting, sporting events, sporting. Let's do with the right look. Observe the world. There's podcasts today. Uh, the Cleveland Indians, where I live for a year, they had that you could go broadcast an inning up in the booth. I bought three innings with my buddy. Hmm. Right, one inning you do play by play. I'll do color flip. We'll flip that. And whoever does best will do the ninth inning. I got a recording of it. My friend was awesome. He was he was he was play by play because he did stuff like and he toes the rubber. I'm like. <laughs> like how do, how do you come up with you know so i can see like you could democratize brought the exclusive non-reproduction non-retransmitted rights no you own the rights mlb let people have live events you provide the platform for it just like you're charging for mlb.com to watch the games or for the app and by the way you might find your next broadcasters based on who has the biggest following Mm -hmm. You can watch different versions. You can have the person who's like just bad mouse the Yankees the whole game. And so I mean, I mean the, the, again, the trash so, broadcast. I like yeah, the trash that. broadcast. You know, the, the trash, you know, the, by the way, the, you're seeing hints of this uh, on, you know, ESPN for like uh, sporting events. You can see which brought you want to watch the Homer team way broadcast. Yeah, the Final Four does that. They where they bring the the old alums and they yeah, it's they, versioning. It's versioning of any yeah. broadcast. So there, there's a chance to version any again. The only reason to have an audience is so that it looks good on television. The only reason to have the live event is so you can version the broadcasting of many events. You make more money from the broad in sports, definitely more money from sure. the broadcast rights. Yeah. Right. The question is, can we emulate that model? In the performing arts, can we? That's a big. That? That's a definitely a big question out there. Is how do you monetize it the way you know? It's just you know, performing arts hasn't made that leap yet. It hasn't changed. Well, now the Hamilton on the Disney, Hamilton on Disney. I think I, whether that's a once in a lifetime type musical, but I think that was an indicator that it's possible. That's great. Here, here's part of the dilemma as I as I see it, is that and, and how how else would it be that out? Is it how somebody else sees it? Of course, it's how I see it. It's like the Seinfeld episode about uh, you remember, if you're a Seinfeld fan where Kramer asks, in your own words, would you describe the events? He goes like, well, who's the other words would they be? So, you know, but uh, um, okay, well, huge tangent got me on a, on a, a side. But here's the way I see it. I, I think some experiences are, that are long established have not viewed themselves as commercial enterprises. Because if you want to open a zoo or a theater troupe way back when, it was either a civic or a non-for-profit enterprise. But we're in an experience economy now. There's for-profit enterprises. You have Cirque du Soleil, right? You have Blue Man Group. Yep. You have uh, you have uh, you know safaris and other animal things that compete with zoos. Zoos. They view themselves as commercial enterprises. So I've actually told some performing arts groups, the the problem is you're a 501c3, and the way you get donations is you just round up usual suspects to give donations, as opposed to a rep, you, you want to incorporate as a for-profit institution. They're like, they're like a gas. Like, are you kidding me? I'm like, well, you want to go under? I mean, we had a we had a red and orchestra in Cleveland, this this chamber, classical music chamber. It was like performance art. I met with them. I gave my time free because I was such a fan, right? People would show up organically wearing red, right? And and I said, like, you can have red a hotel. Read a limo. You could be the limo to get for a wedding in town. I mean, build out your portfolio. Oh, we're in the portfolio. It's against our charter. I'm like, man, these are the things that are just alternative funding mechanism. I'm not against the arts and doing this, but here's the thing. Rather than market, right, advertising, rather than even experiential marketing, can you stage additional events for demand creating purposes? But if you charge for those very events, you have infinite ROI. If you can create, if you can have demand creating events, little mini events that point to your main production, 
and they themselves make money mm -hmm. as opposed to paying for an ad. I mean, so take, and by the way, many of you have the expertise to stage great events. Apply that to your demand creation efforts. Don't hire the, the creative ad agency to run an ad. I mean, this is event-based marketing that's emerging, right? Do it. What's the little mini event that you stage that points to the main? Um, Dean McConnell wrote a book, he's the University of Buffalo. He wrote a book called The Tourists. And the premise of the book is there's plenty of things that are significant in the world to take in as a tourist, just not enough markers to point to them. Mm. Like to tell you that it's even there. You can self-generate your own markers by building out a portfolio of other events that say what you really want to do and support is this. This is why Disney has moved to experimenting with, with Disney, uh, you know, Club Disney, experimented with, you know, Disney Quest and a little, this is why Lego has Lego land, but also like robotic Legos at art museums. They build out a portfolio we have a model in our book, Authenticity, by the way, that builds out 10 different uh, categories, five physical realm and five virtual to build out your, your portfolio. Well, you know, I, I'll tell you one thing. I very much enjoyed this experience. And, oh, and talking I know I can go 100 miles an hour sometimes. That's my, that's my passion for the topic. No, it's, it, it, and it's, it is a great topic and, and uh, you know, really en enjoyed kind of learning more about the experience economy, especially from within the live event space. And, and I think you've give, given our listeners a lot to, to kind of think about, but um, yeah, I appreciate you coming on, on Unobstructed and uh, yeah, maybe we'll have a part two sometime. Yeah, I would, I would love that. That'd be awesome. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys.